today being Father's Day, what I want us to do is look at a story um, during one of the scenes of the life of Jesus about a man uh, who was a father who had all the right priorities. So today we're going to look at a dad with the right priorities. In our world it's easy to have misplaced priorities and to major on the minors and forget what is most important. But here was a dad who had all the right priorities priorities. So let's look at this story beginning in Luke chapter 8, and I'm going to start reading in verse number 40. Luke 8 verse number 40. The Bible says, and it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come to his house. For he had only, or one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. Now, there's kind of a parathetical story inserted. It's a story within a story. Uh, drop down to verse number 49, and you'll pick up the story that we started. Verse 49. While he yet spake, there comes one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he allowed no man to go in, except for Peter and James and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not. She is not dead, but she sleeps. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her food. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. So may God add his blessings today as we look at a dad with the right priorities. Luke chapter 8 is what we call a loaded chapter. It's got to be one of the greatest chapters in all of Scripture, certainly one of the greatest chapters in the New Testament as it chronicles a number of important scenes in the life of Jesus. It is here in Luke chapter 8 where Jesus gives the story of the parable. It's the parable of the sower and the seed. You remember that story? How he says that a man goes out into his field and he scatters seed. And he says some of the seed falls on good soil and some of the seed falls by the wayside. Some of the seed falls upon uh, stony ground. Some falls among the thorns. And as he interprets this parable for us, he says the, the seed is the word of God as it is broadcast. And the soil is the heart and the life of the living. Listeners, and as they hear the word preached, it is like soil receiving seed into their lives. And he says, as an individual would hear the gospel, some would receive it and accept it. It'll take root in their heart and it'll grow and it'll bear fruit. For others, they might pass it off by the sweep of a hand, and it is like a seed being sown on a sidewalk. Uh, the sun comes up and it just burns it up and it can't grow. Or he says, it might be like seed that has fallen amongst some briars and thorns with such competition, the, the good seed in the soil can't seem to take root. And in just a little while, though they may receive it to start with, the things of the world kind of choke it out. So that is one of the greatest parables in Jesus's earthly ministry that really about what he's saying is about 25%, about 25% of the people exposed to the word of God. Now this is not hard and fast, but relatively speaking, about 25% are going to be that good soil. Their lives are going to be that good ground and receive with joy the word of God. So Jesus gives us that parable in Luke 8. He also says, uh, gives us the story of, uh, uh, of the lighted candle. And he says, no man would light a candle or a lamp and then hide it. He said he would put it on a hill for everybody to see. And then as Luke in his narrative, unfolds the next scene in Jesus' life. He gets into a boat with his disciples, and they head across the Sea of Galilee, heading to an area called the place of the Gadarenes. And when he gets into this boat, they set sail across Galilee. Uh, Jesus falls asleep uh, in the bottom of the boat. And then a terrible storm arises. In fact, the storm is so violent and so brutal that his men say to him, they come to him and they wake him up and they say, Lord, if you don't do something... We're going to die. If you don't do something, we're not going to survive this storm. And the Bible says that Jesus gets up from the boat, 
looks out across the churning waters of the Sea of Galilee, and he rebukes the storm, and suddenly the wind is calm, the waves are now calm, the wind stops blowing, it stops raining, sun comes out, the birds are singing, that's the King Daryl translation of what's happened, all right? And it's just a, a, a scene of beautiful serenity as he calms the storm. And then they continue the journey across the Sea of Galilee, arrive in this place called the place of the Gadarenes. Uh, when we were in Israel, you could stand on one side of uh, the Sea of Galilee, and you could actually see across to the very place where the Gadarenes uh, lived. When Jesus got there, he was immediately met by a man whom the Scripture describes as a demonic. He was an absolutely wild man. They tried to chain him. The folk who lived in his, his community tried to chain him, and he had like superhuman strength, and he would break the chains. He would run around unclothed, out of his mind, but when he met Jesus, the next time you see him in the scriptures, the Bible says he is sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And that's the kind of effect that the Lord has on people. Well, now the next scene in Luke chapter 8 is as Jesus returns back across the Sea of Galilee, gets back out of the boat into his place of ministry, a town called the city of Capernaum. And as he is making his journey crowds of people begin to press in on him, and they all begin to, to, uh, to uh, try to get his attention. They're all pulling at his clothing, and they're wanting something from him, and they're wanting his attention, they're wanting his time. And then the scripture tells us this is where a man by the name of Jairus comes up, and Jairus is a dad who is desperate for Jesus. So if you take notes this morning, that's going to be the first point that I want you to remember today. A dad that is desperate for Jesus. Look at the story. Notice verse number 40 says, came to pass that when Jesus was returned, now it makes sense since we have the context, right? He's coming back across the Sea of Galilee. The people gladly received him. They were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus. Now notice how the scripture describes him. He was a ruler of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet. He begged him that he would come to his house, for he had a daughter about 12 years old, and she lay dying. Here is a dad that is desperate for Jesus. In the parallel passage, Matthew chapter 9, you can jot that down and go back and look at it. Matthew is a little more descriptive, and he says that when Jairus comes to Jesus, that he actually falls down at his feet, and he worships him. Here is a dad who is so desperate, and I'm reading this, and I'm thinking about a number of years ago, um, for, for quite a while, once a month, I would go into uh, the prison, uh, not here in Surrey County, but up in Wilkes County, I would go into the prison, and I would share in a prison ministry. And it was on Tuesday evenings, and uh, I would share with some of the inmates there. And I'll never forget, when I, God first opened this door for me to do this, I kind of went into the situation maybe unprepared um, uh, uh, mentally or, or not really knowing what to expect. And I guess I went into that situation feeling as though uh, everybody here uh, deserves to be here, and everybody here, they're getting what's coming to them. Although I never really verbalized that in my mind, I guess that's perhaps what I, what I thought. And when I got there and began to get to know these guys and spend some time with them, and see their life stories and hear their life stories. I had a change in my heart about those who are incarcerated. I'm not saying that they were innocent. And I'm not saying that they were treated unfairly by having a prison sentence. No, not at all. But what I am saying is I look into their lives and I see so many men who were there who were from terrible family situations. And they just could not overcome that in their lives. Some of them grew up without either a father or a mother in their home. Some of them grew up in situations that were very abusive and very, very violent. Some of them grew up in situations where the home was littered with drugs, and it just became a way of life for them. Now, fortunately, some can break that cycle, and that's what we pray for. But I would leave that many times, and I would sense in these men's life a sense of desperation, a desperation to wish they wouldn't have made the decisions that they have made, a desperation to, to get out and to have a second chance in life. 
And God really worked on my heart and, and changed my heart and gave me a deeper compassion because I'm thinking, if it were not for the grace of God, I could be one of those inmates. If it were not God working in my life over the years and through the lives of those who invested in my life, that I could be one of those men in that same kind of situation there, a man who was just desperate. Well, J Jairus here is a man who is desperate for the Lord. The situation is different. Here is a man whose daughter is dying. Now, what would prompt a parent to be any more desperate than to have a child with a terminal illness? We don't know what this little girl's problem was. The Bible just said that she was on her deathbed and as just a young little girl, you would think with her whole life ahead of her, this little girl, the scripture tells us that she lays there and she was dying. And that puts such a desperation in the life of Jairus. He's like, I just can't let this happen without doing all that I can. And in desperation, he goes to find the Lord Jesus for help. I just believe what our world needs is more dads who are desperate for the Lord. I mean who are just really desperate for the Lord Jesus. Our lives depend on it. Our families depend upon it. Our homes depend upon it. Our churches, listen, our culture depends upon it. Dr. James Dobson, who launched Focus on the Family back in the 1970s, said this. He said, the Western world stands at a great crossroads in its history. It is my opinion that our very survival as a people will depend on the presence or absence of masculine leadership in the home. That all the way back years ago, he saw the fact that society is painting dads in a negative light and that there is reluctance on the part of dads to be spiritual minded and hungry for spiritual things in the lives of their family. You see, it has been said that the cure for crime is not the electric chair, but it is the high chair. And the value of dads who would so love their children and so love their families that they'd be desperate for the Lord because psychologists tell us that a child's first God concept is usually what they find in their earthly father. So here is Jairus, a desperate dad. What do we know about him? The scripture describes him as a ruler in the synagogue. This is what that meant. Um, the primary place of worship for the Jewish person uh, would be the temple there in Jerusalem. But in those outlying communities, they had regular places of worship because not everybody could travel to Jerusalem regularly, uh, but they had regular community worship centers called synagogues. And this is where the Jewish families would come together on the Sabbath day, Saturday, and then they would hear the public reading of the Word of God. They would hear a rabbi or a teacher teach the Word of God. Well, Jairus, this was his responsibility. He would take care of the scrolls. He'd make sure they were rolled up, that they would put away. He would be the one who was responsible to see who would read the scrolls that day. He would be the one responsible to see who would speak that day. So here this man, a ruler in the synagogue, was well known in the city of Capernaum. Everybody knew Jairus. Everybody knew him. In fact, some Bible scholars say that he was such a religious, devout individual, such a religious Jewish man, some would say that he was even a Pharisee. Now, we know that those are, Pharisees are kind of painted in a negative light in the New Testament, but nonetheless, he was a very religious man. That's the point I want to drive home to you. So his daughter, we don't even know her name, by the way. We just know she's 12 years old. His daughter grew up around the synagogue. His daughter grew up watching him do his work around the synagogue. But at this point, he is so desperate that his little girl is sick and that she is dying that he is going to go and find the Lord Jesus and bring him to his home. You see, it has been said that you will never be in a place in your life where trouble can't find you. You'll never be in a place in your life where hardship can't find you, where disappointment or even death can't find you. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, says this. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pain. He said, pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. 
It was certainly God's megaphone in the life of Jairus because it moved him to action. And he's like, I've got to go find some help for my daughter. The apple of my eye, my sweet little 12-year-old daughter is lying on her deathbed. I don't know how much longer she's going to live. And I've got to find somebody that can intervene for her. And of course, he'd heard about Jesus. He heard about the miracles that he had done. Perhaps he had already gotten wind of what took place with the demonic of Gadara and how that man was transformed from a wild man into a man who wanted to follow Jesus back to the town of Capernaum, how his life was radically changed. So Jairus no doubt had already heard those stories about him. And he thought if Jesus can do something like that for that wild man, perhaps he can help my daughter get well. So in desperation, he gets up and go, goes to find him. Now I notice this. He doesn't send his wife and say, honey, this is a spiritual matter, and I'm going to delegate the spiritual matters to you. You go take care of that. I'll, I'll take care of paying the bills and working and bringing home the bacon and paying the check, the, writing the checks and doing all of that. You take care of all the spiritual things. He doesn't do that. He doesn't send a friend out to find Jesus. He doesn't send a servant out to find Jesus. But the Bible says he gets up, and in a heart of des desperation and an act of desperation, he goes out to find the Lord. Look in verse number 42, and as he gets uh, near him, the Bible says, as he went, talking about Jesus, the people thronged him. In my mind's eye, I can just see all of these folks kind of crowded around the Lord. One translation says, the crowds almost crushed him. And then suddenly, and you don't see this very often in the scriptures, but this is interesting. When you finish with that verse, it's almost like a, a, a parenthetical interruption of the flow of this story. What would you expect um, Dr. Luke to record as he's talking about Jairus going to find Jesus? You would expect him just to continue to stay on this same theme, right? But that's not what he does. Right in the middle of Jairus coming to find the Lord... There is an interruption that starts in verse number 20, uh, 43 and goes all the way down to verse number 49. It's a story within a story. And this story within a story was this woman who had a hemorrhage of blood coming from her body for the last 12 years. And the Bible says that she had spent all of her money to try to get healthy again. She had liquidated all of her assets. She had emptied her bank account. She had cashed in her 401k. Everything that she could do to try to raise enough money to help herself get well. But the Bible says she didn't get any better. She only got worse. And she, like Jairus, was so desperate that when Jesus came through Capernaum, the Bible says though people were gathered in, they almost crushed him, that she was able to work her way through the crowd. She reached up and she touched the hem of his garment. And when she touched the hem of his garment, it's a truly dramatic scene. Jesus stopped and he said, who touched me? The disciples were like, Lord, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. Everybody's pulling at you. But he knew the difference between a, a fickle crowd and a touch of faith. And he said, oh, no. He said, somebody's touched me because I can feel the, the power go out of me. And he turns to look at this woman he knows her situation, he knows her scene, he knows her desperation, and the Bible says that immediately she is healed. And dealing with this hemorrhage for 12 years after she met Christ now, she's completely healed. That's the parenthetical story. Then you pick back up with the story of Jairus, this dad with the right priorities, back in verse number 49. So let's continue the story. So while he yet spoke, this is Jesus telling the woman who was just healed, Everything's fine now. While he was still speaking, there comes one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, from Jairus' house, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the master. So while Jesus is still speaking, someone from Jairus' home comes, and they said, Jairus, don't mess with the Lord now. Don't trouble him. Your daughter, it's too late for her. She's dead. Verse 50. But when Jesus heard it, <clears throat> he answered him saying, Fear not, believe only, and she be shall be made whole. Look at that word or those words, fear not. The Greek it's phobeo, and it means, it means to scare away, to seize with alarm. Jesus says, Jairus, don't let anything shake your faith. 
Don't let anything scare you away. You came out, of, out here to me in desperation, and now don't leave defeated. You see, one of the greatest examples, I think, as a dad that we could leave our children is to be a dad of consistency, to be a dad that is not easily frightened off by the troubles of life. You see, for some people, listen, some people go through such difficulty that, that when they go through trials, they may feel as though they're being picked on by God or that they've done something that now God's punishing them or that God doesn't care about them, or he wouldn't put all of this on them. And what they do is, is they, they recoil from that, and they kind of play the victim guard, card, and they blame God for the troubles of life. On the other extreme, you have maybe folk who might have it all together in life, so it might, seem, might seem. They may have good health. They may have good positive relationships. They may have money in the bank. They may be financially secure, and everything couldn't be going any better for them. And because things are going so swimmingly, they're of the frame of mind that, God, if I need you, I'll let you know. But don't interrupt my life while things are going so good for me. Neither of those extremes reflect that of a dad with right priorities. What God wants from dads is men who are trustworthy and reliable, who are not intimidated by troubles or hardship, men with backbone who want to serve God and make a difference for the Lord. You see, one day, dads, your daughter's going to grow up and she's going to look for a man and she's going to need to know what kind of man to look for. One day when our sons grow up, he's going to marry a woman and he's going to need to know how he's supposed to treat his wife. And one of the ways he will, will, will understand that is by watching how you've treated your wife over the years and watching how you have interacted with women. So let's model to our children a dad that's desperate for Christ. Not only desperate to know him, but notice the second thing. A dad who's desperate, or not desperate, but determined to bring Jesus home. Look in verse number 41. If you'll go back to verse 41, the Bible says that Jairus fell at Jesus' feet and he asked him that he would come to his house. If you go down to verse 51... You'll see that Jesus actually does that when he came into his house. And remember, everywhere Jesus goes, there's this crowd of people around him. And here's this one man, Jairus, unlike any other. He has a, a, a reputation of being a religious leader in the community, Jewish religious leader. And at this point, the popularity of Jesus was beginning to wane. Because there were some critics of Jesus saying, oh, he goes to eat with people who are sinners. Some would call him even a glutton and a wine bibber. And he said some people would even say that he, that he, that he, that he uh, um, cast out uh, devils by the, by the power of the devil. And they were really criticizing him. So for here to be a religious man was such a heart of desperation that he would go to Jesus and invite him into his home would put Jairus in a very uncomfortable predicament. predicament. It's kind of like, it's one thing to go here and preach, right? It's another thing to bring him to your home. It's one thing to go hear the words of wisdom that he imparts, but it's another thing to say, I would like this man to come to my home and help my daughter. Because really, it was a compromising situation now for Jairus to do this. He was a, he was a well-respected individual in the community. He was a... He was a um, a leader in the Jewish synagogue. And what was he doing? Putting his reputation on the line to be associated with the Lord. Putting his reputation on the line to ask Jesus to come to his home. But here is a man who was determined. He was determined that if there's anything that will help my family, it is to bring Jesus to my home. You know, it is so important that our children and our families know that in our home, we not only love, say, sports in our home, or we not only love video games in our home, or we not only love movies in our home, or we not only love fishing in our home, or traveling in our home, or whatever it might be, the top priority for any father, and any mother for that matter, is to make sure the family knows we want Jesus in our home. It's a good place for an amen, by the way, church. 
that we want Jesus in our home, that he's not just a, a guest who shows up every now and again, that we don't just hang his picture on the wall, and that's about the depth of it, that we have a Bible in our closet, that we take it out on Sundays and, and uh, blow the dust off and pull the pages apart that are stuck together, then we put it back up there at the end of church on Sunday and don't touch it all week. No, what we really want is for our families to know that, that Jesus is not just a guest in our home, but he's the Lord of our home. Here was a man who was determined to see that was what was going to happen. And two different times uh, in this text, Jesus, the Bible says that he comes to, to this man's home. He's, he's invited to come, and then certainly he takes up that invitation, and he comes to the home of Jairus. Do you know in the Old Testament book of Exodus, the Bible talks about uh, the Hebrews um, in Egyptian bondage, and... Um, God sent a series of plagues on the Egyptians to convince Pharaoh to free the Hebrew slaves. You remember this? Ten plagues and all, right? There was flies and boils and frogs and, and uh, the rivers turned to blood. All of these ten plagues that came upon Egypt. The final plague was that of the death of the firstborn child. Remember that? Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments. You can see that fog. My favorite movie of all time. I always say, when I get to heaven, if Cecil B. DeMille's, or if, uh, if Moses doesn't look like a Charlton Heston, I'm going to be disappointed. But uh, you, you see Cecil B. DeMille's, how he portrayed that fog going through the, the, the villages, uh, the death angel, and all the firstborn of every family would die. And there was only one remedy for that. You remember? The Bible says that the father of the family had to take the blood of a lamb and put it on the doors of his home, the doorpost and the lintel of his home. And when the death angel saw that, the death angel would pass by. It is just a picture of a father taking the position of a priest in his home, of a, of a father who's being so determined that he says, I want the Lord in my home. And every father who did that, the firstborn of his family, were spared. In our culture, Listen, there's a death angel like never before passing through our homes. The devil sets all kinds of traps for our children and for our teenagers. Listen, I've never seen anything like it in the times of my ministry. And those of you with any age on you, you know where it used to be and you know how far we've come in the wrong direction. And you take now, the devil works in the lives of our families, and he comes into our homes via television and via computers and via, via our mobile devices, and sometimes our children are exposed to the darkest of the darkest of the darkest of what the devil has out there for them. And what God wants us as dads and men to do is to be that sentinel, to be that guard, to be that priest in our home, to say, this is my home that God has put me in charge of, and I'm going to draw a circle around my family and do what Joshua says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen, church? And be determined, and don't let anything sway you from that. That's what Jairus was going to do. He's like, Lord, my daughter's going to die. All of our families are that shape if we don't have the Lord in our home, and if we're not desperate for him, and if we're not determined to have him in our home. Acts chapter number 4 records a scene just a few weeks after the resurrection when the uh, disciples are at the temple in Jerusalem, and the Bible says that, uh, that they heal a man that had been crippled from his birth. You remember this story? He, had, he was crippled from his birth, and um, uh, Peter and John actually speak to him and say, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. This crippled man is healed. Well, the religious leaders who had just crucified Jesus a few weeks earlier, they were responsible for the crucifixion, were not very happy about that. So they take Peter and John and they really have them arrested. They haul them into court basically and they said, Who gives you the authority to do this? And the Bible begins to talk about how Peter and John and the disciples express the boldness that they have because of their love for Jesus. And this is what the Scripture says. The Scripture calls them unlearned men, ignorant men, meaning simply they didn't have it all together in life. They weren't perfect men. They hadn't been to the best schools that, that Israel had to offer or anywhere else had to offer. They couldn't answer everybody's questions about everything. But one of my favorite verses from that story was the Bible says that it was obvious that these men had been with Jesus. Isn't that a great compliment? That as a dad, we might not have all the answers and we might not have all of it together. But more than anything else, we want to be known as men who've been with Jesus. Make that a determination in your life. 
Yes, I'm going to be desperate for him. Yes, I'm going to determine that I want him into my home and I want him to be the Lord of my life and the Lord of my family. Because our kids are watching, right? Our kids are looking. Our kids are modeling or imitating the model that we set before them. I read the story of a <clears throat> little boy, six years old, went with his grandfather to play golf on a number of occasions, and grandfather trying to teach him a few things about, about golf. And um, one day, <clears throat> all the family was together in the backyard for a backyard barbecue. And this little six-year-old boy, he had out his plastic golf clubs. You know, you see those little plastic golf clubs that kids have, kids have with a big driver on the end of it and plastic golf balls. And this little boy, he's in the backyard, and all of the family and extended family are having a cookout together. And this little boy takes the golf club, and he starts hitting it on the ground. He says a few bad words, and then he throws it as far as he can throw it. And his parents are mortified, and they said, what are you doing? He said, I'm playing golf like Grandpa does. Ah. Listen, they're watching, aren't they? They're watching. They're watching our lives. Be determined to try to live a godly example in front of our kids and to bring the Lord into your home. Let him be the Lord of your home. So you see Jairus, he was a dad who was desperate for Jesus. You see Jairus, a man or a dad who was determined to bring Jesus to his home. Finally, I want you to notice that he was a dad who was dedicated to introduce his family to the Lord. Verse number 51 Jesus, in verse 50, says, don't be afraid, only believe. Your, your daughter, she's going to be made whole. And when he came to the house, he allowed no men to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept, and we wailed her. But he said, don't, don't cry. She's not dead. She's only sleeping. Now, now, remember this, please, that when Jesus says that she's sleeping, he does not mean by that that this little girl is somehow soul sleeping. No, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And when a believer dies, we immediately go into the presence of our Creator. You remember what Jesus said to the thief on the cross? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Isn't that right? So immediately we go to the Lord and be with the Lord if you're a Christian uh, when you die. So what is the Lord saying here? He is simply likening death to sleep, meaning that he is saying to, the, to Jairus, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't let anything scare you away because your daughter, it's like she's just sleeping. We don't fear going to sleep at night because we know we're going to wake up in the morning. We go to bed tired. We wake up rested. We go to bed after a hard day's work. We wake up strengthened again, ready to go work again. That's what Jesus pictures death like for the Christian that death will come my way one day and there will be a pallbearer somewhere that will, that will put the sheet over my head and say, um, he's gone. But like Billy Graham said, when that happens, I will never be more alive than at that moment because you're with the Lord and, and your presence is with him. Just the body would remain here. And Jesus is saying to Jairus, remember he's so desperate, my daughter's going to die, and now he gets the word that she did die, the blood is drained from his face, he's standing there kind of catatonic, not knowing what to do, and Jesus said, don't worry, Jairus, she's just sleeping. She's just sleeping. Now notice what he says, look in verse 53, if you're listening, say amen. And they laughed, and knowing that she was dead, and he put them all out, and he took her by the hand. And he said, Maid, wouldn't you just love to have been a part of this scene? Maid, arise, verse 55. And her spirit came again. And she arose straightway, and he, he commanded uh, to give her food. That this is a whole episode that was motivated by the love that a father had for his daughter. Twelve years old. No answers in life. She's going to die. And the only thing that he knows to do in his desperation is to invite Jesus to come into his home. And sure enough, the Lord comes into his home and he introduces Jesus to the, to the, the remains or the corpse of his daughter. And Jesus, with a solution for even the problem of death, takes her by the hand and says, Maiden, arise. Life comes back into her. 
And he can bring that same kind of life back into all of our broken relationships. He can bring that same kind of life back into our times of discouragement. And that's what he does for Jairus. That's what he does for his daughter. Now listen, I don't know how long his daughter lived after that. We assume that perhaps she lived a regular life like any other lady would live as she grew older. Maybe she even had children of her own. Maybe she lived to a ripe old age of whatever the, way, the age was in the first century when a person would die on, on average. We don't know, but here's what I believe is true about this. That for the remaining days of her life, she was able to say to her children and to her grandchildren, if it were not for the love that my father showed and his desperate uh, attempt to get to Jesus and to bring Jesus into our home, I wouldn't be here now. And she was able to say to her grandchildren as she got older, it was the difference that my dad made in my life because he brought Jesus into our home and he introduced Jesus to our family. I'll tell you, that's a lasting legacy, isn't it? You remember the story of the prodigal son who took his inheritance and he left his father at a young age and he wasted all of the resources that his father was planning on giving him upon his, the father's death. The young boy wanted them while he was young enough to enjoy them and he took everything and he just wasted it. And when he found himself flat broke in the pig pens of life, he said, I've got, I've got to go back home. And when he goes back home, he finds the father who had been waiting for him all of this time. And the scripture says, it's a really a dramatic scene, that while the dad saw this young boy a long way off, he runs to him, puts his arms around him, he embraces him, and he says, this is my son who was dead and he is alive. He was lost and he's found. And he said, go get the best robe I've got and put on him. Put a ring on his finger, put shoes on his feet. Kill the fatted calf because we're going to have a party. And really in the context of the prodigal son's story, the context is really this. It's a celebration, not so much that the son came home, but it's a celebration of the grace that the father had extended to this little boy or this young boy to welcome him back. So it was though the father is saying, we're going to celebrate this because my son, I'm welcoming, welcoming him back into our family. That is the love of a father who never gives up, who never gives up, never throws in the towel on his family but is determined and is delighted and is dedicated to bring Jesus into their home. Perhaps you heard the story of the dad and his son that had been estranged from each other and they had not spoken in quite some time. The son ran off and perhaps years had even passed and they had never spoken again. And one day, the dad had a just a desperate attempt to reach out to his son. So he took out an ad in the newspaper. And the ad read, Dear Paco, perhaps you've heard this, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper office on noon Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you. Your father. Just put that in the newspaper, not knowing who was going to read it, not knowing if his son would ever find it. But on that Saturday, the father showed up there at the newspaper office, and there were over 800 Pacos there looking for their dads. Be that dad like Jairus with that desire to bring Jesus to your home that has your priorities in order. And to say again like Joshua, as for me and my house, I can't help what everybody else does, the decisions that everybody else makes. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the life of Jairus, who was a dad with right priorities. Help us to learn from this story that you are the answer to life's issues, to life's struggles, both here and now, but for all eternity. God, again, we thank you for the moms and dads, both who are here today. And I know that it's not easy being a parent. But God, would you empower them and bless them and give them great grace as they leave their handprints upon their children. As we have this time of invitation, Lord, maybe there's a parent here today and they just have a burden on their heart. They want to come and say, Pastor Darrell, I want you to pray with me that God would just help me during these days. Or Lord, maybe they just want to come and silently pray. 
Maybe others here today, Lord, who want to unite with our church family and say, Pastor Darrell, I believe this is the place God is leading so I can be involved into, in a church home and a church family uh, and I can serve God through a local congregation. I pray they would come. Or, Lord, maybe there's one today that's never been saved and they want to come today and ask Jesus to be the Lord of their life. I'd love to be able to pray with them and share with them. So take this invitation and use it, God, in a way that will honor and bless your, your heart. In Jesus' name, amen.